So today is covariance day. Uh, covariance, you know, it's a long-awaited moment that will let us finally deal with the variance of a sum, for one thing. We said variance is not linear, unlike expectation, but it doesn't mean we, doesn't mean we don't need ways to deal with the variance of a sum. It just means we need, we need to think harder rather than falsely applying linearity. So on, so on the one hand, covariance is what we need to deal with variance of the sums. On the other hand, it's, just, it's, a, it's what we need when, when we want to study two random variables together instead of one. Right? So it's like variance except two of them, so that's why it's called covariance. And uh, so let's define it, do some properties, do some examples. Okay? So first, start with the definition. It's analogous to how we define variance, except we have, now we have an x and a y, right? Because we're looking at joint distributions. Okay, so we have x, we have y. We want their covariance. And we define it like this. Uh, covariance of x and y. X, x and y are any two random variables on, on the same space. Covariance x, y equals expected value of x minus its mean. times y minus its mean. That's just the definition, so you can't, you know, can't really argue with it too much, but, but let's stare at it intuitively for a bit and just see where, where, where might this thing ha have come from. Why, why, why define it this way instead of any other way? Well, first of all, um, it's, it's a product, something times something. So we've brought the, the x stuff and the y stuff together into one thing because we're trying to see how they vary together. And just, you know, obviously we all know that a positive number times a positive number is positive, negative times negative is positive, positive times negative is negative. So if it happens to be true that uh, if x, this is x relative to its mean, y relative to its mean. So if so, so now imagine drawing a random sample, like, like suppose we had a lot of IID pairs, x comma y, where the pairs are IID, but with, within each pair, xi comma yi, they have some joint distribution. They may not be independent. Oh, we d by the way, we did show before that if they're independent, then you can write this as just e of this times e of this. So this is, you know, we, you know we're interested though, what happens if they're not independent? Well, if, if, if in that you know, ran, random sample we drew, if most of the time when, when x is above its mean, then also y is above its mean, then, then you're getting positive times positive. And if x is below its mean, tends, tends to imply that y is below its mean, you, you, you again, you get negative times negative is positive. Okay, so if, if x, ha, you know, you know if, if x being above its mean tends, tends to imply that y is above its mean and being below, being below, then we'd say that they're positively correlated, right? right? And, and vice versa, if it's negatively correlated, if x is above its mean, it doesn't imply that y is below its mean, but it, it has more of a tendency that y will be below its mean, then we would say they're negatively correlated. And, and okay, so this is just a, a measure of, of, of that. We'll, we'll, we'll actually define correlation in, in a little while, but correlation is, correlation is a very familiar term to everyone because people talk about correlation all the time, but mathematically, what is correlation? It's defined in terms of covariance, so we'll get to that soon. Okay, so that's just the definition, but just like you know how for, for, for variance, we had two different ways to write it. We defined variance as, notice the way we defined variance was expected value of x minus its mean squared. So if we let x equal y, that is just the variance. So, so, so that we, we, we just proved a theorem already, so uh, I'll just call this properties. The first property to keep in mind is that covariance of x with itself is the variance. Proof is just let x equal y, oh, that's the definition of variance. So, you know. But that, that, that's a very useful fact to keep in mind. And secondly, it's, it's symmetric. Covariance x, y equals covariance y, x. And that's, again, something you can just see immediately. Just swap the x and y, but it's the same thing. So, so it's, it's immediately true that it's symmetric. Uh, that's also a useful fact. And I don't even want to group it into this list. I'll just write right here, what, what's, the, what's the alternative way to, to write covariance? This is completely analogous to how, you know, we defined variance as this thing, this part squared without that part. 
But then we, we quickly showed that we could also write it as e of x squared minus e of x squared, you know, parenthesized the other way. So the analog of that formula, which is a generalization, is that this is e of x, y minus e of x, e of y. So in general, these two things are not equal. We proved that they are equal if, if x and y are independent, but in general, they're not equal. Notice that if we let x equal y, like in property one here, that's just e of x squared minus e of x squared the other way. So that's just a, that is just a version of, of that formula. And uh, the proof of this is just to multiply this out and use linearity. Uh, let's just quickly do that over here, just, just for practice. And we'll just have four terms use linearity, so it should be very straightforward. You know, this times this, this times this, and, and so on. So, so we have uh, e of x, I'm just gonna use linearity. The first term, x times y, e of xy, and then minus, and then we know, you know, we do this times this. But notice we're doing e of x times this. This thing is a constant. You can take out the constant, right? So that, so that term would just be e of x, e of y. And then we have another uh, cross term, this one times this one. E of x is just a constant. That comes out. So that's minus another one that looks the same, e of x, e of y. And then the last term is this times this. Again, that's just a constant. E of a constant is the constant, so it's plus that thing again. And so that's all, that's all it is. Minus two of them plus one of them. So it's, it's the same thing. Okay, so that, that, that's, that, that's just an easy application of linearity of expectation. Um, so most of the time, this, is, this way is, is a little bit easier than, than this for, for computing covariance. But like, like with variance, you know, th this one ha has a little more intuitive appeal because it's just saying x relative to its mean, y relative to it its mean. But it's the same thing. Okay? So, well, we already have two properties. Well, let's get some more properties of covariance. What if we have the covariance of x with a constant? So I'm letting y equal a constant c. So here y is c, the, the expected value of a constant, c is, is c, that's just zero. So it's immediately just zero, just from the definition, if c is a constant. Similarly, we could have, by symmetry, we could have covariance of c with x, right? I just happened to write it on this side, but it's symmetric. So if c is a constant. Okay, now what if we uh, multiplied by a constant in, instead of just having a constant there. So if we had, let's say, the covariance of Cx with y, uh, let's just use this one. We, we, to, to, to compute this, we, all we have to do is replace x by c times x. c comes out, c comes out, so c just comes out of the whole thing. So constants come out. Okay, so we just proved that just by plugging in Cx in for x, and then it's just immediate. Okay, again, C, C is any constant here. Similarly, you could have a constant here, a constant here, and just, just take them both out. Very, very straightforward. All right, and now we want something that looks kind of like linearity. What, what happens if we have the covariance of X with Y plus Z? So if we take the covariance of X with, with Y plus Z, then uh, what, what that says to do is to replace y by y plus z here, okay? And just, just a quick little, you know, scratch work for seeing what, what's going on. I'm taking xy, replace y by y plus z. Well, of course, that's just xy plus xz, right? And now we want expected value of that, so we use linearity, so it's e of this plus e of that. Similarly, we replace this y by y plus z. So again, use linearity, e of y plus e of z. And, and, and so the, those, those terms you get are, are simply the, the, the sum of the two covariances. So covariance x, y plus covariance x, z. Just write down the four terms you get, and you've, you've just added the two covariances. So again, the, the, all, all of these things are basically immediate. I'm not writing out long proofs for these because all of these things are immediate from plugging into the definition, 
either this definition or, or this equivalent, plug into either one, and use linearity of expectation, and all of these follow immediately. Uh, so the, the, these two together are, are especially useful, and, 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 and they're, they're, they're called, uh, bi it's not linearity, but it's called bilinearity. Bilinearity is just a fancy term that means it's, if you imagine fixing, treating one coordinate as just kind of fixed and you're working with the other coordinate, it looks like linearity, right? So like here, I, notice the, the y just stayed as y. And, and what happened to the cx? Well, I took out the constant, just with lin lin like linearity. And what happened here? Uh, x, x just stayed x throughout. But, but if you just look at the y plus z part, we split it out into the y and, and a z. So it looks like linearity if you're going one coordinate at a time. I just happened to write it this way, but obviously I could have done x plus y comma z, and it would be analogous. I could have put the constant over there, or a constant here, a const constant there. Okay. Um, so, so th th those are you know really useful properties that kind of you know if you use these properties you can avoid a lot of ugly calculations. That is, you can just like apply this rather than always having to go back to the definition. You know, just like linearity is incredibly useful, bilinearity is incredibly use useful uh, when we're working with covariances. So, um, and kind of like a. An easy kind of way to uh, remember this is it, it kind of looks like this distributive property. Like here, uh, you know, there's just a distributive property, x times y plus z is x, y plus x, z. It kind of looks like that, like I'm doing, co except it's, it's, not, it's not literally multiplication, it's covariances, but I'm doing covariance of this and this and this and this, right? So if I wanted to extend that to, to you know, what happens if we have more of them, Let's say we had covariance of x plus y. I mean, this doesn't really need to be listed separately, but, but for, for practice, let, let's just do it. Just apply that property 5 repeatedly, and we're going to get the covariance of this and this, this and this, this and this, you know, that. It's, it's just like multiplying, you know, two, two, two polynomials or whatever, what, however you usually do that thing. So, so we can immediately just write this down as four terms, covariance xz plus covariance xw plus covariance, uh, yz plus covariance, yw. And that follows immediately just by using that property 5 repeatedly. And more generally than that, let's just, let's just write what happens if we have a covariance of one sum with another sum. Rather, I don't, you know, I don't want to write out nine terms. I just, well, let's just write the general thing once and for all. So we have a covariance of one sum of terms. Let's say we have the sum over uh, i of um, a i x i, where a i's are constants. So we have, so this is, you know, a linear combination of random variables. And then we have, an, let's say, i goes from one to m. And then we have another one. Let's say j equals one to n of uh, b, j, y, j. So, so we want the covariance of, you know, it looks like this complicated thing, okay? But, but as soon as you think about what's, what's the structure of the problem, it's just a, sum, a covariance of one sum with another sum. So if you apply that property five over and over and over again, we don't literally have to do that, but conceptually, we're just using that property over and over and over again, and just think about what you're gonna get, and also use property four to take out the constants. Well, it just means you're going to get a sum over all i, j of the covariance of individual terms, right? Because it's just saying, you know, take one term here and, and covary it with one term here for all possible, you know, pairs. So it's the sum over all i, j of a, i, b, j, covariance, x, i, y, j. So that's just a very, I mean, this looks complicated, but it, it, it's no different from property five. It's just, just that, that means we used it a lot of times instead of once. So a lot of times it would be easier to use this kind of thing rather than going back to the definition and multiplying everything out in terms of expectation. It, it's, it's often easier to be able to work directly with covariances. All right, so that shows us how, um, Property one says how, how covariance is related to variance, but it doesn't show us how it would be useful in actually computing a variance, right? So, so, so uh, the variance of a sum, that is. Okay, so one of the main reasons we want covariance is so that we can deal with, with sums. 
So let's just work out the variance of a sum. Let's say we have the variance of x1 plus x2 to start with, but then we could generalize that to a sum of any number of terms just by using this one repeatedly. Okay? Well, we already know how to do this because by property one, that's the covariance of x1 plus x2 with itself. But by property five, or whichever property six, you know, just multiple, covari what's the covariance of x1 plus x2 with itself? Well, we just have those four terms. We have, we have the covariance of x1 with itself, but that's just the variance. And we have the covariance of x2 with itself, that's just the variance of x2. And then we have two cross terms. We have the covariance of x1 and x2, and we have the covariance of x2 and x1, but by the, the symmetry property, those are the same thing, so it's simpler to just write it as two times the covariance of x1 and x2. In particular, this says that if, uh, the covari if the covariance is zero, then the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. And, and that, that's an if and only if statement. So one, one case where that's true is if they're independent, we, we, sh you know, we showed before that if they're independent, then the covariance is zero. So if they're independent, this is gone. And we'll also see examples where they're not independent, but this term is still zero, and so that, then it's true. Okay, but in general, you can't say the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances because you have these covariance terms. Yeah, question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's if and only if the covariance is, is, is zero that the variance of the sum will be the sum of the variance. Um, so let's write the, you know, what, what would happen if there is more than two of them? Variance x1 plus blah, 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 plus xn. Just applying, so that's the covariance of this sum with itself. So we can just apply this result. So it's, again, it's going to be the sum of all the variances. And then we're going to have all these covariances. So add up all the variances and then add up all the covariances. And so, so you're going to have a co covariance of x1 and x2, x2 and x1, x1 and x3, x3 and x1, all those things. I think it's easiest if we write it as two times the sum over i less than j covariance uh, xi, xj. It's easy to forget the two here. I could have also written it as i not equal to j, in, in which case I would not put the two. It's, just, it's, sim it's simply the question of are you going to list covariance of x1, x2 separately from covariance of x2 and x1 or group them together? Seems a little simpler to group them together, but then we need to remember to put the two. So, so then I'm, since, since I specified i less than j, then I have covariance x1 and x2 listed here, but not covariance x2 and x1 because I included that here. All right, so that's the general way to get the, the variance of a sum. And, um, We'll do some examples of that in a few minutes. Uh, first, I want to just ma ma make sure that the connection uh, with independence is clear, and we also need to define uh, correlation. So, so theorem uh, says that if x and y are independent, then they are uncorrelated. Uh, the definition of uncorrelated is just that the covariance is zero. That's just definition. I.e., covariance equals zero. And we actually proved this la last time when, when we, we just didn't have the terminology yet. We, at least we proved it in the continuous case, but the discrete case is, is analogous. So, so, we, so we, we proved this u using the two-dimensional lo lotus thing that, you know, we did, we did e, e of x times y and right, equals e of x, e of y in the independence case. Um, so, so we showed that before. Um, converse is false. And that's a common uh, mistake is, 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 to, is to show show the covariance is zero and then just leap to the conclusion that they're independent. If the covariance is zero, if the, and that's all we know, they may or may not be independent. Um, so just to give a simple counterexample, sh sh showing why, why this doesn't imply this, uh, let's just, let's just look, consider an example with, 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 with normal random variables. So let's let z be uh, standard normal and let's, 
and, and we'll let x equal z, so slightly redundant no notation, but, but I, I'm, you know, I'm just in the habit of using z for standard normals, and y equals z squared. So we're looking at a normal and, and its square, okay? So now let, 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 let's uh, compute the covariance for this example, covariance of xy equals e of xy minus e of x e of y. In terms of z, that's e of z cubed minus e of z e of z squared, but both terms are just zero because we saw before that the odd moments of a standard normal are zero. That's an odd moment. That, that's an odd moment, so it's just zero, zero, minus zero. So they're uncorrelated. But they're clearly not independent. In fact, they are very non-independent. I should say very dependent. Avoid too many double negatives. So they're very dependent. In fact, y is a function of x. So that they're extremely dependent. If you know x, you know y, complete, complete information. So y is actually a function of x. We don't, you know, independent just means there's, a dependent just means there's some information, right? It doesn't have to be complete information. In this case, if we know x, we have complete information about uh, y. Uh, y is a function of x. And if we go the other way around, if we know y, well, we don't know x, but we do know its magnitude, right? We don't know, if we, if, we, if we know z squared, then we can take the square root and we'll get the absolute value. So we know it up to a plus or minus. So that, that also shows it's dependent, you know, go, going the other, the other, which we didn't need to do, but it's just nice to think, you know, if you know this, okay, we know this. If we know this, then what do we know? Well, we know it up to a sign. Um, uh, so I would just say uh, y, also determines x, at least it determines it up to a sign. So it determines the magnitude of x. So, okay, so that's just an example that, that, that shows that the converse is false, but it's kind of a handy counter example to keep in, in mind uh, for, for a lot of things. So, kind of intuitively what's going wrong here, I mean there's nothing wrong with this, but what, 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 why the definition doesn't capture this is, is uh, part of the intuition of correlation is it's kind of, it's kind of a measure of, of linear association. And those of you who've you know, taken STAT 100 or 104 see a lot of th things lo lo like that, where you actually have a data set, and you know, if it kind of looks like it's you know, sloping upwards, generally you, know, you have this cloud of points, and does it kind of go upwards or downwards, that, 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 that kind of thing. It's measuring linear trends in, in some sense. Uh, there, there's a theorem that we're not going to prove that says that if if every function of x is uncorrelated with every function of y, then they're independent. But just, just, ha just having the, the linear things be, be uh, uncorrelated is not enough, as this example shows. Um, okay, because, because you know, the, here they have this quadratic relationship, there, but there's no linear relationship. Uh, that, that's kind of the intuition on that. All right, so uh, let, let, let's also define correlation, and, and, and th then I'll do some examples for, you know, how, how do you compute how do you use this to, to compute the variance of, of things that we did not already know the variance for? Okay, so, so once we have covariance, which we do, uh, correlation is, is easy to define. And I'll tell you some of the intuition as well as, you know, what, what, what's the math. So here's the definition of correlation. Um, you can think of it as just a standardized version of, of covariance. So correlation which either write as C-O-R or, usually I write as C-O-R-R, -R, just because R's tend to look like V's sometimes if you're writing too fast. Uh, correlation of X and Y, uh, usually it's defined this way, as the, the covariance, and then we divide by the product of the standard deviations. Remember, standard deviation is just the square root of variance. So take the covariance, divide by the square root of the product of the variances. Um, that, that's the usual definition. I actually would prefer to define it a different way, and I'll show you why the, these are equivalent. Uh, I would prefer to, to define it as the covariance of, 
uh, x. Remember standardization? If we have any normal, we subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, that gives us standard normal. So that's called standardization. Now here I'm not assuming anything is normal, but the, but the, but the same standardization ma makes sense, that we take x, we subtract its mean, we divide by its standard deviation, and then we do the same thing with y. So, so, that, so we've standardized both x and y, and we take their covariance. So correlation means standardize them first, then take the covariance. The reason that this is a useful thing to do is that covariance kind of has annoy an annoying property as far as um, interpretation in, 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 ter in terms of like units and things like, like that. Like if you, if you imagine that x and y are uh, distances, right? They're, they're random variables, but, but, but they're, you know, they're representing uh, you know, a, a distance quantity, okay? And, and if, if you um, measured x and y in nanometers, and then, and then someone else working on the same problem measures them in, in light years instead of na nanometers, it's gonna get extremely different answers. So if I just tell you, well, the covariance between my x and y is 42, what does that tell you? You have to think really hard about what, what are the units, what's going on, and, and you know, is 42 a big number or, or, a, or a small number, right? I mean, it's, it's the answer to life, the universe, and everything, but is it a big number or a small number? I don't know, because the units thing. This is, is a dimensionless quantity. Dimensionless just, just basically means un, unitless. So if, if, if x was measured in nanometers and you're subtracting off nanometers, that's, that's still nanometers. Standard deviation, that, remember, that's why we define standard deviation also. The standard deviation has a square root in it, so mathematically it's pretty annoying to deal with the, these square roots. Mathematically it's nicer to work with variance, but intuitively the uh, variance would be in nanometers squared. Now we're back to nanometers. Divide nanometers by nanometers, we'll get a dimensionless quantity. So, that's a major advantage of this. And I guess I should tell you briefly, why is this thing the same as this? Well, you should kind of just think about the, 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 those properties. I'll just say this kind of quickly. Uh, first of all, s s subtracting the mean, that's, that's just adding a constant. Uh, that, that's not gonna affect the, the covariance at all. So, so I could have left this out, but it's, 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 it's just useful to think of standardizing, because you know, this standardization, what it does is it takes x, which could have any mean and any variance, and it makes it have mean zero and variance one. That's why it's called standardization. Uh, the, the, the part that, that's, that's affecting what's going on is, is the standard deviation, but, but you know, from one of those properties we wrote, we can just pull out the standard deviations, and, and we would get exactly that. So they're exactly the same thing. Uh, I just think this one's a little more intuitive to think about. Okay, so one, one quick theorem about correlation. Correlation can never equal 42. Uh, more generally, correlation is always between minus one and one. So not only is it something more interpretable in the sense that it doesn't depend on, on what system of units you used, it's also more interpretable in that, you know, if I say a correlation is 0.9, that's a, that's, that, that's a pretty high correlation, because I know the largest it could be is one, okay? So, so that, that's very useful. And, and a kind of an interesting fact about this inequality is that it's essentially just Cauchy-Schwartz, for those of you who have seen the Cauchy-Schwartz uh, inequality in, in linear algebra or elsewhere. Uh, Cauchy-Schwartz is, is one of the most important inequalities in, in all, all of mathematics, and if, if you put this if you rewrite this statement in, in a linear algebra setting, you can show that it, it, it's essentially Cauchy-Schwartz. If you haven't seen Cauchy-Schwartz yet, we'll, we'll come back to it later in the semester, and you don't need to worry about it right now, but for those of you who have, I want to make the connection right, right now. Uh, so let's prove this fact. So one proof would just be to, to put it into the Cauchy-Schwartz framework and apply Cauchy-Schwartz, but you know, that, that doesn't really show you what's going on, first of all, and secondly, that assumes you're fam familiar with Cauchy-Schwartz. Uh, so let, let's just prove it directly. Um, so first of all, um, math classes, you'll often see the, the acronym W log, uh, without loss of generality, we're gonna assume um, X and Y are already standardized. 
if they're not already standardized, so we're trying to prove this inequality. So let's just, we may as well just assume, assume from the start that they've been standardized, standardized meaning that, that they have mean zero variance one, because if they weren't standardized, well, I, I could just make up some new notation like x tilde, y tilde for the standardized ones, but this says that the, the correlation will be the same anyway, so we may as well assume that they're already standardized. All right, so, so, so now let, let's just compute the variance. This is actually good practice with, with that uh, property seven there. Let's compute the variance of x plus y. Well, that's the variance of x plus the variance of y plus two times the covariance of x and y. And for some reason, uh, statisticians often like to call the uh, co correlation rho. So I'll follow that trend. Correlation of x and y, there's just notation. Let's just name it rho. Th rho. All right, so that's the variance. But I assume they were standardized, so this is one plus one. And if they're standardized al already, then, then the covariance is the correlation because they're standardized. So that's just one plus one plus two rho. So that's really just two plus two rho, right? On the other hand, we could, we could look at the variance of the difference. Again, that, that, that's good, good practice with, with, with variances of you know, sums and differences. A common mistake is to say, oh, that's the variance of x minus the variance of y, well, you know, which, which we talked about that fact before when we were talking about you know, sums and differences of normals. Variances can't be negative. So think of this not as x minus y, think of this as x plus minus y. So it still adds variance x plus variance y. Now, it, now we subtract. To just check this from, is the covariance of x minus y with itself? So, 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 we, so, we, ha, so we have a minus on the covariance part, but, but not on these variance terms. So that's just two minus two rho. Okay, well we're running out of space on this board. That's actually the end of the proof because variance is non-negative. So these two inequalities say that rho is between minus one and one. All right, so that, that shows the correlation is always between minus one and one. And, um, and so, you know, in general, it's easier to work with covariances than correlations, but correlations are, are, are you know, more intuitive and, and it's, you know, standardized and everything is between minus one and one. Okay, so uh, I wanted to, to, for the rest of the time, do, do, do some examples with, with, oh, um, with this thing and also with computing covariances for certain problems we might be interested in. Um, so let, let's talk about the multinomial, because we were talking about that last time. And now we actually have the tools to, to deal with the uh, covariances within a multinomial. Okay, so, so, so this is just an example, but it's an important example because multinomials come up a lot. So we want to we wanna compute covariances if we have a multinomial, okay? So covariances in a multinomial. That is, this multinomial is this vector, right? It's the ve how many people are in category one, how many people are in category two, and so on. So you could take any two of those counts of how many people are in category one, how many people are in category five, and compute the covariance of those things, right? That's a very natural thing to look at. And I actually know four or five uh, ways to der derive this, and I, and I really like uh, this example, so I'll probably come back to this later with some of the other methods, but uh, for now, let's just do one, one method, okay? So we have this multinomial. So we have this vector, uh, using the notation from last time, we have k different categories, and, and x, xj is the, is the number of people or objects in the jth category. And this is multinomial. Uh, n, that there are n objects or people, and, and the probabilities you know, are given by, by some vector p, that, that, just, that just gives the probabilities for, for each uh, category, okay? And we want to find the uh, covariance of xi with xj for all i and j, right? So first of all, let's consider the case uh, i equals j 
then we just have the covariance of xi with itself, and we know that, that that's just the variance of xi. And last time we talked about the fact that if we just look at one, d define success to be being in category i, we just have a binomial. So, 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 so for, this, for this, we just use the variance of the uh, binomial, npi1 minus pi. So that's easy. The, uh, the more interesting part is what happens if, if, if i is not equal to j. OK? Now, uh, if, if we, uh, I think it's easier to th just think concretely in terms of the first two. So let, let, let's just find covariance of x1 and x2. If we know how to do this, we, we could always just relabel things and get with, you know, x5 and x12 or, or whatever we want. But it's just easier to think concretely in terms of x1 and x2 rather than having so much notation going around. OK, so I'll find this one first. And th there's a lot of ways to do this. Well, let's just think about it intuitively first. Uh, intuitively, do you think this is positive, negative, or zero? Negative. Why? Exactly. So, so if you if, if you somehow computed this and you got a positive number, you shouldn't just you know be happy you're done with the problem and move on. You should stop and think. Does a positive number make sense here? As you just said, if you knew that there are more people in the first category, like there's tons of people in the first category, there's fewer people left over who could be in the second category. So, you know, it's like these categories are, are kind of competing for, for membership, right? You have a fixed number of people. Not like the chicken and egg problem, where we had a Poisson number of eggs, okay? It's a fixed number of eggs competing for different categories, more in one than you'd expect less in the other. Right? So they should be negatively correlated. All right, so now, now how do we do this? Well, there's, there's a bunch of, of ways, as I said, uh, but, but one, one way that I especially like is to relate this back to stuff we did last time. We talked about the, the lumping property of a multinomial, try to relate it to, to this. Normally, you think of this as a way to find the variance of a sum, but if we know this, this, and this, then obviously we know this also. So let's actually do it this, this way, and I'll probably do some of the other me methods la la later, not, not today. Um, so we have, let's take the variance of the sum. Um, let, let's call this thing C, J just to have some notation. So we're trying to find, solve for C. Okay, so we have the variance of the sum equals the sum of the variances. Now, the variance of x1 is np1, 1 minus p1, and the variance of n2, the variance of x2 is np2, 1 minus p2, and then it's plus twice the covariance, but I just named the covariance c, just to have a simple name for it, so it's plus 2c. So the only thing, we, we want to solve for this, the only thing left that we haven't gotten is this, but then that follow, variance of x1 plus x2 follows immediately from what I was talking about last time with the lumping property. Uh, this, this just says merge the first two categories together into one bigger category. Okay, if we do that, it's still binomial, right? Now, now, now we're defining success to mean uh, being a member of category one or category two. Still binomial, so we can immediately write down that that's well n. Now the probability of success is p1 plus p2. 1 minus p1 plus p2. So now we, we know every, everything in this equation except c. Just solve for c, you know, multiply things out, factor it, however you want, just, just, just do the algebra. Uh, e easy algebra at this point, so I'm not gonna actually like write out, well, I'll multiply this times this and this time, you know, just multiply it out, simplify, and what you'll get is the covariance of x1 and x2 equals minus n p1 p2. And so in, in general, that was just for x1 and x2, just for concreteness. The general result would be the covariance of xi xj equals minus n pi pj for i not equal j. Notice it, it is a negative number. 
Okay, so that, that's the covariance in the multinomial. And um, let, 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 let's do a few variance examples now. Um, well, for example, variance of the binomial. We, we did derive the variance of the binomial before using indicator random variables just directly because we didn't have these tools available yet. Okay, so let's redo the variance of the binomial and then do, do one more example after that. So, okay, so the variance of the binomial NP is NPQ. And let's just derive that really quickly. Um, so let X be binomial NP, then, and we write it as, as, as we've done many times, X equals X1 plus blah, 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 plus XN, where the XIs are uh, IID Bernoulli P. Now each uh, XI, let's do a quick little I indicator random variable re review. We, we can think of these XJs, uh, they're Bernoullis, but they're also indicator random variables. It's an indicator of success on the Jth trial. Um, so just, just for, uh, let, let's just state this in general. Uh, let, let's let I, let's let capital I and capital J, uh, well, let, let's say let a, I sub A be indicator random variable for event A. Just, just in general, A is any event, I sub A is its indicator random variable. Indicator RV of event A. Okay, so just a couple, couple quick simple facts about indicator random variables. Uh, what's I sub A squared? It's just I sub A, because you're squaring zero or one. Similarly, I sub A cubed equals I sub A, and, and you can generalize this to other powers if you want. It's just, it's zero or one. This is a very, very, very simple fact, but I've seen it get overlooked many times, so, so I'm, I'm emphasizing it now. Take, take any positive power, nothing happens because it's zero or one. Very easy. Okay, now let, let, let's look at something else. I A times I B, where A and B are both events. How would you write that as one indicator random variable? Intersection, extremely useful, simple fact, but often gets overlooked. Product of these indicators, well, it's zero or one times zero or one, that's gonna be zero or one. It's gonna be one if and only if both of those are one. That's the definition of intersection. So that's immediately true, very useful fact. Okay, now coming back to this binomial, if we want the variance of xj, That's just e of x j squared minus e of x j squared. But e, x j squared is x j. So that's just e of x j. And we know e of x j is p for a Bernoulli p. This one is p squared. So that's just p one minus p. Okay, so it's extremely easy to get the variance of a Bernoulli. And if we, if we define this as q, let's define this as q, then we're just saying p times q. Okay, so, so Bernoulli p, you get p times q. Very easy. Um, so now we want the variance of the binomial. Well, it's just NPQ. Done. Because you're adding up N of them. They're, in, they're independent for the binomial. We have independent Bernoulli trials. Uh, so just to write out a little bit more, covariance of XI, XJ equals zero for I not equal J because they're independent. They're not only uncorrelated, they're independent. So we don't have any covariance terms, so we just add up the variances, n, n, times, p, n times this, npq. All right, so, so now you can do the variance of a binomial in your head. You know, you don't need to memorize this, it's just n times the variance of, of one, one of, of, of these Bernoullis. Okay, so that's easy. Let, let's, 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 let's talk about a more complicated one, though. Hypergeometric. So let, let's, let X be hypergeometric with parameters um, W, B, N, which we interpret as saying we, ha we, have, uh, we have a jar that has W white balls, 
B black balls, we take a sample of size n, and we want the distribution of the number of white balls in the sample. Well, again, we can decompose it in terms of uh, indicator random variables. Um, so xj equals one, if the, imagine, um, we can interpret this as, as drawing balls from, from the jar one at a time without replacement. We get a binomial if we did with replacement, but the hypergeometric would be without replacement. Take the balls one at a time, and we just say one if the jth ball is white, zero otherwise. The problem, the, uh, the reason it's more difficult than this is, is that these are dependent indicator random variables because it's without replacement. So if we write this thing out, variance of x equals, um, so we're going to write out you know, all these variance terms and all of these covariance terms. Sounds like it's going to be a nightmare, okay? But there are some symmetries that we can take advantage of. First of all, we, we have the sum of, of all the variances, so we're going to use some symmetries here to make life easier. This, this goes back to a homework problem about, um, I'll talk a little bit more about. Variance of x is n times the variance of x1, because you can think of x, let's say we're looking at x times x7, let's say the, se the seventh ball, you know, like on the, the homework, you know, where you, you know, problem where you pick two, two balls and a lot of students we're, we're struggling somewhat with the fact that to consider the second ball, don't you need to have considered the first ball? Okay. But when we're just looking at like x7, the se that, that depends on the seventh ball, we're imagining it before we've done anything. Okay. Now the seventh ball is equally likely to be any of the balls, right? Because there isn't like a certain, some balls like to be chosen seventh and other ones don't, right? It's completely symmetrical. So this is just n times the variance of x1. Similarly, for all the covariance terms, two times, and then there, there are n choose two of these covariance terms, but we may as well just consider the covariance of x1 and x2. Symmetry. So you, you, should, you should think through to, you know, to make sure you see why, why does sim symmetry hold here. For the first, so for the first ball, I mean, variance of x1, that we just get, you know, use, using a, a Bernoulli, right? Um, so that's easy to get. But let, let's, let's think a little bit about the covariance of x1 and x2. So this part we already know. This we now know if, if, if we see the symmetry or not. But you should make sure you, you see the symmetry in this problem, because if there's symmetry, you want to take advantage of it, and if there isn't symmetry, you don't want to falsely assume it. So you have to, you know, be very careful about that. Symmetry is powerful, but but dangerous. All right, let's quickly get covariance of x1 and x2. Well, that's e of x1 x2 minus e of x1 e of x2. E of x1 x2. Let's do the second term first. That, that's easy, that's, that's just the, the probability, fundamental bridge, the probability that the first ball is, is white times the probability that the second one is white, but both of those are W over W plus B. Okay, now for this term, E of X1, X2, let, let's use the fact here that the product of two indicator random variables is the indicator of the intersection. So this event here, uh, this, it's expected by an indicator, fundamental bridge, that's the probability that the first two balls are both white, well, the first ball has probably W over W plus B, and then the second ball being white, given that the first ball is white, is W minus one over W plus B minus one. So then we have the covariance. So we know this thing, we know this thing. So at this point, you know, we can just do some algebra and simplify everything together. I'll, I'll, I'll clean this up next time and give the final answer, but at this point, we, we, know, we know the answer, it's just algebra. Okay, so see you on Friday.